Jasky Singh asks, for all those that don't understand the benefits of fasting, how does doing a fast differ from, say, eating a diet, low carb, high fat that puts you into ketosis? And what key metrics, for example, blood tests, should someone look at to know it is benefiting you? Very interesting question because, as implied by the question, there are at least a few similarities between a low carb, high fat diet and fasting, but there are also obviously some key differences. Probably the main similarity between the two is that metabolism shifts from using glucose as the major source of energy to primarily oxidation of fatty acids in ketone bodies as energy. When it comes to fasting, there are a few things that really differentiate it from a low-carb, high-fat diet. One of the major benefits of fasting, particularly prolonged fasting, which is around four to five days in humans, that is not found on a low-carb, high-fat diet is a dramatic increase in autophagy and apoptosis, followed by a massive boost in stem cell production. Autophagy is a genetic program that is very important. It clears away damaged cells to use for energy, while apoptosis is a genetic program that causes damaged cells to self-destruct. Both of these processes prevent damaged cells from becoming cancer cells. When we clear away damaged cells, this also means those cells are less likely to become senescent, which is what can happen when too much damage accumulates. A senescent cell is technically a living cell, but it is not functioning in a way that is consistent with maintaining the overall health of an organ. In fact, quite the opposite. Senescent cells can accelerate the aging of nearby cells and promote tumor growth by secreting pro-inflammatory molecules and other factors. Senescent cells are bad news. As we age, they are everywhere from our livers to our hearts to our brains, and they accelerate the aging process. It has been shown in mice when given a compound that increases the clearance of senescent cells, it actually extends their average lifespan by 20%. Another way that fasting really shines, particularly prolonged fasting, is that prolonged fasting has a very robust effect on increasing stem cell numbers. The regenerative power of tissues and organs decline with age. It is stem cells that provide this regenerative power, and because stem cell numbers decline with age, so does organ function, which means anything that can counter this is a win. Fasting also causes cells to clear away damaged mitochondria and recycle their defective components for energy, called mitophagy, followed by a concomitant generation of new mitochondria called mitochondrial biogenesis. This is a really great thing because mitochondria accumulate damage with age, just as cells do, and this can accelerate the aging process. So not only does fasting clear away old, damaged mitochondria, it also generates new, young, healthy mitochondria to replace the damaged ones. There has also been some evidence that suggesting that a low-carb, high-fat diet may modestly increase mitochondrial biogenesis as well, but not mitophagy. Another thing fasting does is it increases the levels of something called nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide, or NAD+, which I will just refer to as NAD. NAD levels always increase during a fasted state and decrease during the fed state, no matter what food type. NAD is a very important cofactor for many metabolic enzymes, which just means you need it for these enzymes to work properly. Your mitochondria need NAD to produce energy from glucose or fatty acids. Anytime there is chronic inflammation or DNA damage occurring, this sucks up the NAD, and so the mitochondria suffer. Also, NAD levels decrease in multiple tissues with aging. There are several different compounds, which are various forms of vitamin B3, that dramatically increase NAD levels and have been shown to delay aging in multiple tissues in mice. Yet another difference between fasting and a low-carb, high-fat diet is that fasting activates many repair processes, including repair of damaged DNA, damaged cells, damaged mitochondria, and damaged proteins. You must be in a fasted state to repair damage, which is why most repair processes occur during sleep, because that is when most people are in a fasted state. Fasting improves blood sugar, insulin sensitivity, and blood lipids, and improves inflammatory markers including C-reactive protein and tumor necrosis factor, also known as TNF-alpha, and improves adiponectin, leptin, and brain-derived neurotrophic factor in humans. A low-carb, high-fat diet has also been shown to improve blood glucose and insulin levels and also reduce inflammation, but not always consistently, and may be highly variable depending on the individual, which is likely due to the fact that the way our bodies respond to food is also complicated by genetics. We have variations in our genes that make them operate a little differently from similar versions in other members of the human population. These variations are known as genetic polymorphisms. One of the best examples I have seen yet demonstrating the immense variability in how people respond to the same foods was a publication that came out in 2015 in the journal Cell. The study looked at the blood glucose responses of over 800 different people to various foods, including fat, 
Without getting into all the details of this study, what is important to the topic of this discussion is that while most people had a low glucose response to dietary fat, some people had a high glucose response. There have even been a few important gene polymorphisms that have been identified to play a role in the context of a high-fat diet, such as FTO, PPR-alpha, PPR-gamma, and APOE4. PPR-alpha is one of the most important genes that I'll mention because it plays a very important role in the process of ketogenesis. Activation of PPR-alpha promotes uptake, utilization, and catabolism of fatty acids by activating genes involved in fatty acid transport, fatty acid binding and activation, and fatty acid oxidation. There is a polymorphism in this gene that has been associated with lower PPR-alpha activity and a twofold higher risk of type 2 diabetes, increased levels of triglycerides, increased total cholesterol, increased LDL cholesterol, and especially important, increased small dense LDL particles in the context of high saturated fat intake and low polyunsaturated fat intake. Obviously, measuring these blood biomarkers will help illuminate whether any type of diet works for you. There are also a variety of resources on the web that can help you take your raw genetic data from services like 23andMe and find out whether you have some of these polymorphisms. I similarly offer some resources for this on my website, foundmyfitness.com, for this purpose. In terms of biomarkers, things that I would monitor, particularly if I were doing a ketogenic diet, might include biomarkers for lipid and glucose metabolism, such as LDL, small dense LDL particles, total cholesterol, triglycerides, glycated hemoglobin, HbA1c. You can also measure your fasting blood glucose levels and ketone levels at home using something like Precision Extra, which I find to be mostly reliable and I also use. I also like to be aware of any inflammatory biomarkers I can get my hands on. There's some common measurements like high sensitivity C-reactive protein and also IL-6 and TNF-alpha. For those people experimenting with a strict ketogenic diet for greater than six months, it may be wise to measure thyroid function by doing a full thyroid panel. There was a recent publication where a ketogenic diet for nine months caused thyroid dysfunction in children with epilepsy. This may not be something to worry about in everyone, but it does not hurt to be cautious. For autophagy-related and stem cell-related biomarkers, there are some used in research that you unfortunately can't really get a hold of for self-monitoring purposes. For autophagy, LC32, and for stem cell self renewal, Lin negative, CD184 positive, CD45 negative cells. Okay, one quick closing point to sort of finish this section off. It's important when we talk about fasting that we make clear distinctions between the various duration of fast we're talking about. If we discuss prolonged fasting, as I have done a lot in answering this question, that means we're talking about a water fast on the order of four to five days. However, in mouse research, this level of fasting is actually achieved in two to three days. This has led to some confusion because people often attribute the so-called benefits of prolonged fasting to shorter intervals that are a bit more manageable because they might have ran across this rodent research. The fact is that we may see some of the same benefits such as autophagy even with shorter fasts, but on an order of magnitude greater with prolonged fasts. Also, with a prolonged fast, we see entire organ systems can shrink and then can experience renewal during the refeeding period. So it should be pretty clear that we're actually talking about a whole different level of cellular cleanup that can occur, which is above and beyond what we actually get in shorter fasts. There's still a lot of research going on to better tease out the differences between shorter, let's say two-day fast, and fasts that meet the definition of being a prolonged fast. I'm optimistic that evidence will continue to emerge and that even shorter dura duration fasts are still very beneficial. That said, as Tim likes to say, I'm not a medical doctor and don't play one on the internet. If you're thinking about giving prolonged fasting a shot, make sure to follow the prudent podcast listeners rule and run it by an actual physician. There's also an emerging body of literature surrounding a fasting mimicking diet that lasts five days instead of four and can be prescribed by a doctor by a packaged meal plan if having that structure is helpful. 